So today, I uh, my name is Tori. Hello, I'm with YPFP Tokyo, and I'd like to introduce Chuck from Midori Farm, located in Kyoto, if I'm correct. And just to introduce Chuck a bit, um, Chuck was born near Chicago, Illinois, and moved to Japan in 1998. He has been teaching for over 20 years and farming for more than 10. Before planting his first garden in 2009, he had never studied farming nor had any experience. Learning as he went, there were many setbacks and a steep learning curve. But what started as an excuse to spend time in nature soon turned into a regular hobby. As he found success and began growing more than his community of friends could eat, he began seeking vegetable customers in Kyoto City. At this point, he learned the value of his work through the support and interest of his ever-growing clientele. Through this hobby, through this, his hobby turned into a passionate vocation, which he took on full time in 2021 when he left teaching and found more fields in a new location. He now manages seven fields in Shiga and Kyoto, farming six days a week and delivering over 600 baskets a year. Alongside his passion for nature and organic food production grew an interest in sustainability. And in 2017, he co-founded Seeds of Sustainability in Kyoto City to host events, workshops, and meetups. He has returned to teaching, appearing as a guest lecturer for universities, groups, and other gatherings, both in person and online. With the goal of spreading the word about the power of organic farming, he has created a YouTube channel produced a TED talk, TEDx talk, and is implementing a farming education program in 2022. Chuck continues to search for new ways to allow others to experience for themselves the tremendous value of joining a community dedicated to raising healthy food in balance with the environment. So we are so excited to have you today, Chuck. I'm really looking forward to this and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Tori. I really appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and begin my presentation now. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about organic farming for a better future. I think uh, a lot of people hear the term organic farming and immediately associate it with natural living, healthier lifestyle, uh, more expensive, perhaps better quality. Um, harder to get, um, but there isn't really a lot of um, hard evidence about organic. And even after doing it for over 10 years now, I find that there's still a big question mark in my mind about what is organic farming. So that's the first thing I'd like to address for everyone right now, because I think it's an open-ended question, and there are a lot of ways to go about defining it. Um, so the use of organic was popularized by Albert Howard and Jerome Irving Rodale refers more narrowly to the use of organic matter derived from plant composts and animal manures to improve the humus content of soils. Um, it was grounded in the early soil scientists who developed what was then called humus farming. So basically what this means is um, when you're a farmer, you're not just growing vegetables, you're really building soil, um, especially organic farmers believe this because soil is the medium in which everything that you grow exists, where it's born, where it lives and thrives, and finally where it dies. And when it dies, hopefully that matter that it has taken from the soil is in part, if not in whole, put back into the soil, because that is the way to be sustainable. And that is the way to really allow um, your soil to grow every year and not be depleted. So I think it's very important that um, we understand what humus and what soil building is all about. And what they're talking about here is using all natural uh, materials to do that. And I think that's very important for organic farmers. And almost all organic farmers you would meet would probably say they compost to some degree. Um, but I really like what Wendell Berry said in The Gift of Good Land. An organic farm, properly speaking, is not one that uses certain methods 
and substances and avoids others. It is a farm whose structure is formed in imitation of the structure of a natural system that has the integrity, the independence, and the benign dependence of an organism. Now, this is quite a wordy statement, and it may be a little unclear, but I think the first two points at the bottom are the natural system that has the integrity and independence of an organism, which means that something that really can exist on its own and would exist on its own if left to its own uh, devices. The dependence that it has is that the farmer has created this well, let's call it an organism. It's a farm, but let's call it an organism. It's created this organism for a specific purpose, and that is to raise vegetables or fruits or grains or something of that nature. And because of that, there's a specific purpose in mind. There is a little bit less of nature involved because there is that purpose. There is that intention. Nature is best often left to itself, and that's what nature is. Whereas something man-made, is something that we have an intention for. So we necessarily guide it and shape it and try to control it to some degree. And so that is really a great definition of an organic farm because I don't know of any organic farmers out there who are completely 100% letting nature just take its course. Um, otherwise we just wouldn't get very many vegetables at all because most of the vegetables and, and fruits and other things, the foodstuffs that we grow is much weaker than a lot of the plants out there that would compete for the soil and the nutrition the space and not strong enough to deal with all the insects and weather problems and other things like that. So it would be a poor farm indeed for one who just was completely 100% natural. So it's always that conundrum is, can organics be 100% natural? I think the answer is no, but it's more of the tendency towards nature that I think is important. I wanted to speak a little bit about the history of agriculture because I think that's important to give us a perspective. But basically, 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, oops, I'm sorry, kind of went there. I'm trying to admit people into the waiting room. Is there someone else who can admit people for me? Excuse me, I'm going to break out of my. Got it, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I just, I'm having trouble controlling everything. I'm going to go ahead and admit that one. But if somebody else can do it from now on, that would be really great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and press play again. Mm -mm. So um, until about 10 or 12,000 years ago, basically, we were just hunting and gathering. Uh, we were just traveling the, the, the planet as best we could, trying to find food wherever we can get it and subsisting on that. Our, our diet was very diverse and rich, but we were eating things like roots and insects and animals and things that just about we would just choke on right now. Um, but when cultivation began of these, uh, these vegetables or these foodstuffs that we started to grow, the whole culture of humanity changed, as did the food available. Um, so basically for the first millennium or so, yeah, first several millennium, I'd say uh, five or six millennium, we were completely organic. There was no distinction there. But um, as early as 400 BC, the first organic pesticide was, was found to be used in Persia. And it was pyrethrum, which is uh, basically a plant-based organic compound sourced from flowering chrysanthemum plants. And this is amazing. It was, a, it was a great breakthrough that found that we could control our environments of our farms by using pesticides created from flowers. And this is something that's still done today. And then you fast forward to the 1880s, about 140 years ago, when something called the Bordeaux mixture was, uh, was, in, was created. And this is one of the earliest inorganic chemical pesticides. It was a combination of copper sulfate and lime. Um, this was really funny, kind of funny because it was developed to stop the kids from stealing the grapes. Um, but they, the farmers found that um, it was a great way to control powdery mildew, which was a big problem and continues to be a problem for um, people who grow grapes and things like that and other vegetables. I've had a lot of powdery mildew trouble myself on my vegetables. So, But this was one of the first... Uh, uh, inorganic chemical pesticides found. So this is going away from organics. 
And of course, going back about 80 years ago in the 40s, uh, chemists and chemical companies started to more widely utilize organic chemistry to synthesize and commercialize pesticide products. So this is when the laboratories really came into effect with chemical pesticides and herbicides and things to control the environment as well as uh, chemical fertilizers. Of course, there were several positive impacts of the development of a large profitable and global commercial agricultural industry. Because obviously uh, with all these chemicals at work, helping to kill the bugs and the other weeds, um, the farmers had more time to take care of the plants and had more time to plant more plants. And suddenly there was a lot more food and it was abundant, affordable food that spread to the supermarkets and grocery stores around the world. It gave us much greater diversity of food and it was a cheaper price. It seemed like a winning combination. All these chemicals were kind of the heroes of the day. But it was only found out later that these, this conventional agriculture caused increased greenhouse gas emissions, soil erosion, water pollution, and threatened uh, human life. So these are clearly things we know a lot about now. Um, and this is why I, I like to talk about organic farming because I feel like it's a viable option um, in this day and age when we can create things um, that are so fantastic about going into space and the internet and um, smart technology and all of these other things, um, viruses and uh, you know, antigens and all of this other stuff, we can certainly figure out how to grow organic food more efficiently and effectively to reduce the amount of effects we're causing on the environment. However, there's a lot of camps on this. Um, depending on who you ask, they're gonna, you might get a different story about organic versus conventional farming. Of course, the industries and the powers that be that are tied into the, the profits and the uh, benefits of chemical farming are going to tell you one side of the story like this, um, that organic farming does have lower yields, that's proven, uh, compared to conventional farming, and which means additional agricultural land would be needed elsewhere in the world uh, to grow enough food, which means that natural land, the land that would be inhabited by wildlife and trees and forests and things like that, would have to be converted into agricultural land. And this can cause a loss of biodiversity and negative climate effects that outweigh the local environmental effects that might be positive of organic farming. Well, you know, that's, that's a viable argument for a lot of things. Um, but that is one side of the coin. Uh, there was a 21-year study in Switzerland that concluded that uh, the crop yields of the organic system averaged on, only 80%. Uh, or as much as 80% of the conventional ones, which is quite high. However, the fertilizer input was uh, 34 to 51% lower, um, requiring less fertilizer, indicating a more efficient production system. And the organic farming system used 20 to 50% less energy, which was a great savings. Um, this lower pesticide input and the quality organic press was the same as conventional analytically and even came off better in food preference trials. This is a lot to think about. Um, this is a lot to process about organics versus conventional. And you'll hear a lot more information about this kind of stuff because there's a lot of small studies. There's a lot of big studies and there's a lot of opinions around out there. But basically what we're showing is there are people who don't have the backing of huge corporations and huge foundations and huge governments and other uh, sources of money putting out studies that are proving that organics is a viable option. Excuse me, I'm gonna admit somebody here, so I have to do that. So let's, let's learn a little bit about what's the situation with organic farming right now. Um, by world region um, from 2000 to 2008. Um, in 2001, the global market value of certified organic products was estimated at US $20 billion. Uh, it went up 3 billion in 2020, uh, 2002. And by 2015, it was more than doubled at 43 US billion dollars. Uh, by 2014, it reached 80 billion. 
And North America and Europe accounted for more than 90% of all product sales. However, Australia was the big winner for producing it because they produced 54% of the world's certified organic land uh, with 35 million verified organic hectares or 86,000 acres. Good job, Australia. This graph will show you a little bit more about the, the continents and how much they are actually contributing to the organic uh, supply of food. And really, Oceania, good job on you. Really good on you. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. North America is that thin red line. Um, Europe, much better, but still nothing like what Oceania is doing. Um, Latin America doing great. And it really looks like Asia, Africa, and North America really could do a much better job of producing the organic food, not just trying to sell it. But uh, as of 2020, approximately uh, 75 million hectares or 190 million acres worldwide were farmed organically, representing approximately 1.6% of total world farmland. I don't know about you, but that is a depressing statistic for me. Only 1.6% of total world farmland is dedicated to organic farming. Um, and it's because I know what value organics brings to the table. And not only the value it brings, but the negatives it doesn't bring to the table, that I'm so depressed by that. And I'm really hoping we can get that way over 50% at some point in my lifetime. Um, but here's hoping. The important issues that organic farming does address are global warming, pollution, soil health, community support, individual health, our connection with nature, our autonomy, food security, uh, self-sufficiency and food safety. Um, something I wanted to note about food security is some organizations say that organic is inefficient to meet the standard, to meet the needs of the growing human population while others say the efficiency is not much lower yet better in the long term. And this is what it's all about is, um, if you've ever taken a statistics course in your life, you'll learn that the one thing is always true that statistics can be used to prove just about anything or at least show it in numbers. And so I want people to look at these statistics and look at other studies with a, you know, a careful eye to what who's making that study, who's funding it, and how flashy is it? Because the people out there who are really trying to make a difference are often the ones without much money and without much support, because, uh, and that's why their voices aren't very loud. So we should try to listen more and try uh, to see more about organic farming, because it really is something that helps us create a better future. And about that part of the lecture, I think I'm completed. What I wanted to do now was give everyone kind of an idea of how I came into this and where I started. Um, you probably could gather from my lecture. I'm, I have an eye for science and statistics and uh, some of the studies out there, but I am not an educated farmer. Uh, and if you heard my introduction, you'll remember that I came to Japan um, in 1998 without a single a uh, foot ever been put onto an organic farm once in my life or a farm in general, never grown a plant. I had uh, never even thought about farming, spent time in a classroom, read a book or anything. And um, it wasn't until I fell in love with this valley that you're looking at the picture of right here. That's about an hour and 10 minutes north of Kyoto city where I live. And I fell in love with it that this whole story started because um, I've always loved nature. I loved hiking and fishing and hunting and camping as a kid. And when I came to Japan, I lived more of an urban life than I ever had. And when I found this little hidden valley, I just fell in love and I thought, gosh, I wanna come back here more and more. I tried to buy, buy land there, but I couldn't. So I just decided to start gardening instead. And that's where it all started. I mean, this place is just beautiful. Um, this is called Unkai or Cloud Ocean, and it happens in the fall. Uh, it's just spectacular. And coming from just outside of Chicago growing up, uh, we had lots and lots of snow, a lot more than they do these days with global warming. So 
um, Snow White's made me very happy because a heavy snowfall meant, hey, no school. And seeing my son being able to play in the water, just like I did when I was a kid, just one of those uh, one of those boxes that's checked in the father's life. And this was one of my first fields. Um, I, that's not even my tiller. I had to borrow it to use and I didn't really know what I was doing. Clearly my field is all full of weeds. You can see two rows of negi or spring onions or green onions that are already going to flower. So I really didn't know much about what I was doing. Um, just kind of learning as I went. That was part of the adventure. And when I did finally get something like a basket of tomatoes that looked like this, I thought it was the greatest treasure ever. Um, so I really learned the value of growing food from the ground up, making lots of mistakes. I like this picture very much because it was the first year I was actually able to grow a second season of vegetables in the same year. Um, my, my tomatoes, my eggplants, my peppers, and my potatoes and sweet potatoes had all been harvested, my pumpkins. And this is my lettuces and onions that I put in in the late summer, early fall. So I could actually get two rounds of vegetables in the first year. Most vet, most professional farmers get three so or four even. So this was a great milestone for me. These two gentlemen uh, who lived who still live in the village, quite elderly now, but very spry. They not only gave me the opportunity to farm because I use fields that both of them own, but they gave me the inspiration uh, and uh, mainly because they are quite aged now. Uh, the gentleman on the right is about 95 now. And on the left, he's nearing 80, 90 right now. And still they're out there every day, you know, puttering around the fields and the farms and their buildings and taking care of stuff because they've lived in the mountains their whole life. Um, they drink the mountain water, they breathe the mountain air, and they eat the mountain vegetables. And I can tell there's a vibrance there uh, in that whole ecosystem that really resonates in them and everything around them. That that really inspires me to keep going and to bring people up there to try it for themselves. And as I said, I'm pretty much self-taught, um, but I do a lot of driving, of course, being an hour and 10 minutes away from my fields. That's about two and a half hours round trip usually. And so I started listening to podcasts and this is a great one, Farmer to Farmer with Chris Blanchard. It's just a fantastic podcast for anybody growing food. Um, unfortunately, Chris has passed now, but what he left was behind is such a tremendous legacy to all growers. Uh, just he's a, He was a professional farmer and he would speak to other farmers all over the country, all over North America. Uh, about what they're growing, how they're growing it, how they're selling it, what problems they have, what tools they like, like what tips they have, what troubles they have, and sharing these things. There's over 200 episodes, each one at least an hour, an hour and a half long. It's just gold. It's absolute gold. And he not only inspired me to farm better, but also to create my own podcast. And this guy, Mike McGrath, he's just hilarious and wonderfully, he's the wizard of uh, of of organics and he's fantastic he makes a radio show out of pennsylvania philadelphia area and he just he takes phone calls and answers questions for whatever you got whether it's your roses are dying your tomatoes are are exploding or your lawn is on fire or whatever it can be he'll answer your questions as best he can with a joke here and there and uh just again another a real legacy he's leaving behind of, of information and tips and tricks for growers everywhere. Both these guys have really helped me a lot. Uh, inspired me to do things like on the left, you see what's called a raised bed um, that I built out of some end cuts from the local sawmill. Um, and I filled them with soil, you can see on the right. And now they're growing peppers. And you can see along the tops there, I have some strings running along, and that's called a Spanish trellis. I also learned that on the podcast, and this is a great way to support a whole line of peppers rather than have to stake each one out. Composting. Um, if, if you're not doing it, you should be, or you should be in a composting program because all the food scraps you create in your kitchen basically can create solid gold soil for any farm or garden anywhere on the planet um, instead of in this country where it's burned, incinerated and lost and waste of gasoline and uh, you know, just a burden on the environment, creating more carbon dioxide. So I really recommend trying to get into a composting program as soon as possible. 
I know I have, I've created some in the city myself, and I'm hoping to do more next year with a special program I'm going to roll out pretty soon. So after learning all these things about composting, raised beds, Spanish trellises, and all these other tips and tricks, well, suddenly my little basket of tomatoes became 10 or 12 boxes of zucchini every time I would go to the farm. And you not only see zucchini there, a few different varieties, you see some yellow squash, some okra, some eggplants, some butternuts, and some acorn squash. Um, and these are things that I harvested in a single day, and I wasn't selling vegetables at this point. And this is when I learned, gosh, I really got to get out there and figure out how to sell these things, or at least give them away, because who can eat all these vegetables? And I tried. And this was my potatoes on the left and my sweet potatoes on the right, just absolutely bumper crops every year. I was, I was really figuring out this farming thing. I learned how to actually create food. What a wonderful thing to be able to do to create food is just such a wonderful feeling. But I needed to learn about distribution. I tried selling to restaurants with some success, but it wasn't a good match for me because they liked their deliveries earlier than I could get it to them. And they'd like to set a uh, number of things every, every day so they could prepare their meals and have their menus straight. So it just wasn't a good fit for me. I tried farmer's markets here, which sound great. And everybody loves the farmer's market. But when you're farming, usually you don't really love the farmer's market because on your day off, guess what? You're the one working at the farmer's market. No, some people like it, and some people have their wife or their cousin or their uncle or their brother work the market for them. But for me, I'd rather take the day off, and it wasn't a good fit for me either. I've done a few farm stands with mixed success, also not a perfect one, perfect fit. But the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, or TAG system, that has worked for me for over five years. And that's where people basically dedicate themselves to buying a mixed basket of whatever I have once a week or twice a month, whatever suits them. And I harvest it that day. I put them into baskets and I deliver them straight to their house without having refrigerated it or packaged it. And they get a basket of fresh vegetables just like they want them. That's a great system for the farmer and for the consumer because it's the lowest price point for the customer and the highest price point for the farmer. One of my first customers, she was a restaurant owner. And basically, this is when I first came up with those giant baskets of zucchini and squash, and she would just trade me a dish of her delicious food for a big box of zucchini. I thought it was great, and so did she. One of the farmer's markets that I was working, this one was pretty successful, actually, uh, for me, but a lot of them weren't because, as you can see, I don't use any plastic. Nothing on my table is wrapped in plastic. And when the, this was a nice summer one where there aren't any leafy greens, but when I tried in the fall and I had my spinach and my cabbage and my lettuce and things, the table next to me had everything wrapped in plastic and I had no, no plastic whatsoever. The table next to me sold out and I sold nothing because everybody here wanted it in plastic, which was really depressing. One of my farm stands. This was set up uh, outside a cafe that I was good friends with. Again, mixed success. And I did have to put stuff in plastic bags because it was out in the sun. So again, not a perfect fit for me. But I did set up my website, it's midorifarm.net. And this is where I set up my take case this in description. And this is where I get most of my customers. So this was really the best thing. Again, community supported agriculture or take a. Events also were, played a big part in my life. I loved, like I said, bringing people up to the village in the mountains, letting them experience nature for themselves, see the farms, pick some vegetables, hike up the mountainside, swim in the river. Um, because I've always believed that old tenet that says, um, you'll never love and respect and try to protect that which you've never experienced. So giving people the chance to feel it and taste it and listen to it and sleep in it for themselves, that gives them the opportunity to fall in love and then to respect it and to want to protect it. So I think that's a big thing, especially for kids. Get them in early so that they have a lifelong love for this kind of stuff. That'll preserve nature better than anything. Hiking along the trails up to this giant horse chestnut tree that's just massive, uh, must be 400 years old. Swimming in this river right outside nice and deep, full of fish, 
wildlife, including snakes. And, you know, I tell people, yeah, there's snakes, there's poisonous snakes, but don't worry about them. They don't want anything to do with you. Doing workshops. Um, I've been a teacher for more than half my life and having kids on the farm. I, I, I know for a fact, I see their faces and I, I watch them react. The farm is a natural classroom. They're very attentive. They want to know, they want to learn, they want to touch they want to taste, you know, they want to experience what's out there. And we did a shiitake mushroom log planting them one. The kids just absolutely went to town with those. It's so much fun. And with the tiller as well, you know, everybody wants to get involved. And until then, I just had a few people out to the farm. And these ladies on the right, they there's some friends of mine who said, yeah, we want to come out and help you on the farm. I said, really? Why? And they said, well, we just want to try it out. And I was like, okay. And at this point, I had no idea that people like doing this stuff. So I had them out, gave them lunch, gave them everything they wanted. Because I'm like, wow, I'm so lucky to have people to come out with me, you know. <clears throat> Some other people came out later. And that's when I learned about Work Away, which is a tremendous organization that puts together hosts uh, who can be farmers or who can be school owners or business owners or lots of different things, just a private family who wants an au pair and people from around the world who want to travel to that country, they can uh, sign up to stay with them and get room and board in exchange for working 25, 30 hours a week, uh, doing whatever's needed and to have a real cultural experience. It's a wonderful thing. And if you haven't uh, volunteered before, I, re I really recommend it. And if you have a project that needs some help, Take, check it out. It might be a great way for you to find some volunteers and have some wonderful lifelong friends to, to boot. These were some of my first work awares um, on the farm there. Uh, one guy from Switzerland, another from France. And I still love these guys. They're, they're my brothers. I, I'm so happy to have met them. They helped me so much. And they were very interested in how to grow broccoli. That's what we're looking at right there. And not only did I become very close with them, but uh, these three people uh, became lifelong friends themselves and are still in touch. And I find that that's part of the reason they come out is they want to meet other travelers and other people interested in doing what they're doing. So it's a wonderful way to experience life, to help people out and um, yeah, to uh, meet, meet some new and incredible people. Uh, I was then told that, you know, to make some extra money, I could run tours. Uh, so I did, became an Airbnb host for experiences. And it was very popular until Corona hit. I found that um, Corona really shut down the borders, So there weren't really any tourists to come out. And I'm sure anybody in the tourist industry can agree with that, that that was just a horrible time. And hopefully that's coming to an end. But lots of people came out, families, this family of three. Uh, with their child who just wanted to come out, pick and wash carrots, had a great time. Uh, two groups of, uh, or actually this is one uh, young couple who came out and met the other young couple who were my volunteers at the time. And we all had a great time, even though it was raining all day. It was a wonderful experience. This giant family from the Philippines came out, uh, had a great time. And they're actually farmers in the Philippines. And what do they do on their wedding trip they come to japan and they want to visit a farm <laughs> so and there on the right you see two of my volunteers uh who were helping me out with this and i found that again the the people who came out on the tours were often more interested in my volunteers than they were in me <laughs> which which was kind of nice but also i was a bit jealous because i thought oh wow i thought you came out to see me uh so these were some statistics that i, I kind of put together uh, for events, I've had over, now I've probably had over 30 events, more than 400 attendees. Just last Sunday, I had 25 people out to help me harvest my sweet potatoes. Uh, 35 volunteers is a lot more than that. I've probably had more than 50 now from 20 different countries around the world. Uh, Airbnb, I've probably run two more tours since then, so I'm about 30 tours with guests from about 15 different countries, including Japan now, which was great. Um, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I took on farming full-time in 2021. I started farming in a second area called Kehoku. Uh, my YouTube channel has grown and grown. I have over 65 videos on there now. Um, I'm hoping for more subscribers because 
few of my videos have gotten over 20,000 views and uh, I can't get paid because I don't have enough subscribers, but I suppose that'll happen in time. I've been doing a grant program for my sweet potato fields. I'm about to re-up that for a new project. And I've been doing some online farm events, much like this one, where uh, I either talk about farming or I, I'm out at the farm and I discuss what I'm doing out there and have people can ask me questions. I'm looking to do more farm experiences in English and consulting with people who want to grow vegetables online or in person and maybe doing something like a film festival uh, to help support um, other people who are doing a, a, a project that uh, needs some support and some, uh, some promotion called the SOS Green Screening. Now, these are some statistics uh, in Japan that I like to show people because this is basically our reality. And this was 2015. So this is quite an old statistic now, but I guarantee you this situation has not gotten any better. Um, but this is basically the food self-sufficiency ratios in major foreign countries. And Japan is now well below 40%. I think it was around 33 last year percent about the number of calories consumed are, that are produced in Japan. And it's just awful. It's absolutely terrible. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Japan eats a lot of wheat, um, bread and pasta and things like that. And that's fine, you know, but none of that is produced in, in, in Japan itself. So that's all imported. Um, and also, of course, Japan likes to eat a lot of meat. And while, of course, uh, Japanese grow, uh, raise a lot of livestock, chickens and pigs, um, and beef here is quite world famous, you know, Kobe beef and things like that. However, what do those animals eat? The grains that those animals eat are not grown here. And over its lifetime, all those animals eat far more than their weight in food. So even though the animal grows up here, the food doesn't. And that's why basically Japanese uh, self-sufficiency ratio is so low. Basically, if we return to a traditional Japanese diet of rice, vegetables, and some seafood, we would be much closer to 100%, much, much closer. These are some other uh, kind of startling statistics that uh, in the past, uh, in the 10 years from 2005 to 2015, 30% uh, of farms basically closed down. And in the same time period, uh, the number of corporate or industrial farms went up 240%. And probably the most staggering statistic of all is the average age of farmers back then in 2015 was 65 years old. So considering how labor intensive farming is, um, it's time for some younger people to step up and take over the tractor or the, or the hoe or whatever, however they're farming, because we really do need a lot more farmers here. And farming is a lot of statistics, a lot of learning, a lot of work. But um, you know, when I bring my put my head up from my field and my vegetables, my weeding and my weed whacker and things like that, I often see creatures like this skink scampering about right on my field and feeling like I I may not have created a habitat for this animal or this creature, but I've created what I'm doing here has not taken away their habitat. And that gives me a real peace of mind because I've always loved nature, as I said. And even for those who don't consider themselves absolute nature lovers or who would just shriek at the size of sight of this uh, lizard, um, knowing that you're not doing anything to kill it um, is probably going to make you feel pretty good. I'm looked at uh, by these frogs all the time. I have literally thousands and thousands of frogs on my farm every year, all through the summer, crawling all over everything. Um, and they are one of the um, great measures of the health of an ecosystem. If you, if you look at some scientific reports that the frog population is one of the first things that suffers through a lot of chemical pesticides. And seeing all these frogs reminds me that, um, well, I'm not doing that uh, that badly if I'm having this many frogs on there. And I'm sure, sure glad I'm not spraying, spraying any of these chemicals. 
and just all these insects, big, fat, heavy, lazy insects munching on my plants. And I don't mind uh, because I feel like they have as much right to them as I do. Now, that's not going to say that I don't dislike several insects who eat more than their share. But it is nice to see these giant grasshoppers and other things out there. Of course, it's top of the insect food chain, the praying mantis. Always a pleasure to meet on the farm. And yes, we are not the only primates out there. Um, in Japan, there's a lot of monkeys. And monkeys create a lot of trouble for farmers. As you can imagine, um, they have thumbs. So they can pretty much get in anywhere and figure it out. They work in teams. And I've had more than 30 or 40 monkeys on my field for an hour eat my entire field of vegetables before, not just once, several times. And they come back and they come back. And it's nearly impossible to keep them out. So after my battle with them for years and years, I moved all my operations to a new area where there are no monkeys. Because really, I was just feeding all the monkeys at one point, which feels nice in some degree, but actually it's, it's no way to make a, a real living. And yeah, the poisonous snakes, the mamushi here, uh, I've seen more than a dozen on my farm over the years. Um, I like to leave them alone when I can, but because I have people on the farm, I have to think about ways to manage their population too. So, but it is nice to see them again, an apex predator. And this is a Yamakagashi, kind of a rare snake in Japan. And nice to see it near my farm. And these other creatures that just abound, um, it's a wonder again to have them around. Um, I think uh, they remind me that we're not the only ones here. It's not just our planet. Beautiful butterflies that have just hatched and can't even fly yet. And you can get right up close to them. And of course, spending time with my son on the farm, um, knowing that, you know, I'm not expecting him to become a farmer. Um, but I do know that he's coming to appreciate things on a deeper level than he would have if he wasn't given the chance to be out on the field, planting the potatoes and then harvesting the potatoes and then eating the potatoes and things like that. He has a real understanding and appreciation for it already. And that's something, again, he can carry with him his whole life. Conventional versus organic. When you eat these peas, uh, these sugar snap peas, you don't even think about how they were raised because they're just tremendously sweet and wonderful. And knowing that you don't have to wash them before you eat them because there's nothing been sprayed on them is just a plus because you just eat them right off the plant. Very, you know, more less than half of them go in the basket most of the time because they're so tasty. Nothing like a big table full of butternut squash. Um, it's a great storage crop, easy to grow, uh, very healthy and just so delicious. Halloween pumpkins, I grew several giant ones for years and years. But here's a point for an organic farmer who's trying to make a living at it. You know, yeah, maybe you can sell these and make some money, but the amount of space you have to dedicate to these giant plants, I mean, these pumpkin vines spread for 20 meters. The leaves are ginormous. So you really have to give them a whole field or a whole corner of your field. Um, which takes away all the others. And you're really not creating food. You're just creating something aesthetic. And that has given me pause more than once. So I've stopped growing these things because I find that um, while they're interesting, it's not really sustainable to grow something that we're not eating. Um, growing these daikon in the snow, um, these daikon are so ugly and ratty but I guarantee you they're sweeter than any daikon you've ever tasted because they grew up in the snow. And you can kind of see behind them this cage and this net. They were grown that way to keep them away from the monkeys because the monkeys absolutely love my daikon. And it's because of the snow. Um, the science of it is that the starches and the, and the radishes sweeten when they're cold because the starches convert to sugars to, to protect and feed the plant. So after the snows, the daikon are sweeter than they were before it snowed, which is why growing up in the mountains is sweeter daikon than growing down in the city. But we don't know this. We don't know the best food. We don't know about the sweetness in our daikon because of profit. The best profit is to grow it down in the valley where there's machinery and closer to the city 
and easier to regulate. No monkeys, not a lot of insects to kill off and things like that. So it's us farmers, our little farmers who really know what the best food is. And again, some of these vegetable shots just remind me of my past and um, my hope for the future because uh, I feel like when you're connected to growing vegetables and you feel like what you're eating is what you're growing and that what you're eating is giving you the energy to grow even more, you're part of this tight little circle that is so sustainable. And not only that, but you're feeling the wisdom and the practice of generations that goes back five or six millennia of agriculture, all that human endeavors to try to try to create our own food to best serve us isn't just for the best taste or the fanciest or the best looking, but it's about the most nutritious and the best for our community and the best for our environment. So if I'm to leave you with any message, it's really to consider what you eat, not just something that tastes good right now, but something that which is nutrifying your body and supporting something that's better and bigger than yourself. Thank you. I'm going to stop my share now. Okay. I'm available for questions if anybody has any. Um, I'm going to take a look at the chat now. Maybe that's a good place to start. Um, let's see. Tristan Norman, Wendell Berry's amazing. I hope more people can read it, to be honest with you, Tristan. Thanks for saying that. And Swan, um, you said, my first time approaching the organic farm, Defi. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean there. If you want to explain, uh, that would be great. And Yen, uh, one of the most inspiring farms I've ever known, though I joined many communities in organic farming across US, Europe since 2018, because of my strong passion for gardening and farming. That's great to hear, Yen. Glad to hear it. Uh, you'd really love to share this webinar with those communities. I remember I'm a member of over 20 or 30 such communities worldwide, especially the community humans who grow food. Oh, I'm also part of that. I had my little snippet in that. That's a great one. Some amazing stories worldwide. I encourage you to share your story there. By the way, many of such communities are in Japan because I want to learn the Japanese language through such amazing hobby. Yen, you'd be very welcome to visit my farm or connect with me personally. Uh, remember, my website is midorifarm.net um, and you can contact me through that. I'd be looking forward to talking to you or anybody else for that matter who's listening. And Pervy, uh, it was so inspiring and feels so close to nature. Thank you for sharing your experience. I might bug you for farming tips. Pervy, I'd be happy to help if I can. But I find that farming tips are often something elusive. It's just more sharing the experience and us both getting something out of it. So I look forward to hearing from you. Um, thank you. Yeah, the pictures are so lovely. They don't do it justice, though. But the real loveliness is, is you know, Working in the in, in one at one p.m. in the hottest day of the year, sweating, burning, and then a cool breeze just happens down the riverside, and you feel like you're in heaven. That's the something you can't take a photo of. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, and you have to leave early. It's time to pick up the sun in Vietnam. Hope to catch up with you guys. What a social media. Okay, well, what a pity. Thanks for joining again. And if you're listening to this later, please contact me. Um, and then your presentation is amazing, Powers for Love and Nature and Gardening. I hope so. Um, again, it's not just my message. It's one that I've heard from several others, and I feel like I'm just part of the general message of this is something that's easy to connect with because we all eat, and um, we're all part of this world, and we all want to be part of a better community, and this is one of the things that really kind of creates a lot of opportunities for that. Um, and the group thing is, do you recommend any compost programs for those of us in Tokyo? I don't know of any, but, um, if you bug my good buddy, John Walsh, that's J O N, um, he's an urban farmer there. He might be able to put you onto something because, uh, he's, he's hooked into a lot of networks. So yeah, I might I recommend you, you bug him and you let him know that I told you so, cause he's a great guy um let's see what else based in the cities would you be able to recommend resources that we might be able to manage on a small balcony 
resources such as books or something like that. I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. Um, John, again, and I are good friends. He's an urban gardener, and I'm the city, uh, the countryside one. And we run podcasts uh, about once a month. We have six episodes up on my YouTube channel, which is also called uh, Midori Farm. Um, you can check that out. Join us for the next one. And again, reach out to John personally. He's at businessgrow.org, I believe. And uh, that's a great way to start. Um, but also just both John and I have the same feeling. Go out there, get a container, some soil and some seeds and start. Um, even me, somebody who's been in this over a decade, I don't really just grow vegetables for vegetables. I grow them for the experience of learning and knowing that there's a good chance I'm going to fail. And failing only happens when you give up. Uh, it's just probably learning one more way of not to do it or realizing, yeah, actually, actually you do have to water these things, you know, once in a while or put them in the right sun or harvest them when they're ready or protect them against insects and things like that. So start the process. Think of it as a process, not just uh, not just a finished product. Um, accepting orders from my website. Everything looks delicious. Yes, um, if you are interested in ordering a basket of vegetables, I can I can post it uh, to you. So please just send me a message to my website again, midorifarm.net. Um, Tristan, I've read a bit of Wendell Berry University, almost religious studies and environmental science. Wow, that's a great combination. Uh, a little God and a little environment. I think that goes hand in hand. What inspires me about Wendell Berry, the River Thames Berry? I think that's a longer answer. Uh, maybe we can connect later and talk about that. But thanks for thanks for asking. Uh, Tori Bender, interested in starting a farming experience for travelers with local farmers and residents in my community. What first steps would you recommend taking? Um, well, again, who's running the tour? Um, is it going to be you or is it going to be the farmers? Are you just kind of expediting things or managing things? And you just got to work out those details and try to find the best times of year so that people coming out can have a real great experience. Um, some of the highlights that people like on my farm is when they can plant something, when they can harvest something, and when they can taste something. Those three things. If you can put it in lunch, boy, you've hit a home run. This lunch actually has the stuff that we picked this morning. Now, even if it's just a salad, um, that is really the game changer for most people to see that, you know, you know, I just picked that thing and now it's in my mouth kind of thing. Um, that real local taste. It's the experience that people come out for. You have to imagine that. Why are these people coming out? They're not coming out to get dirty. They're not coming out to, um, you know, really learn how to weed out your broccoli or how to trellis your tomatoes. I mean, that's interesting and all, but they're looking for that real connection with nature and food and their bodies that you can provide by just putting it in front of them and letting them touch it and taste it and feel what that's like. Um, oh, thank you for posting about my website. Um, so it's going a little faster now. Pete Lee says, Midori Farms look like a lovely place. Love to come volunteer and learn from your experiences. We have a tiny family permaculture farm in Goya, India, run on the work away program. And it's so beautiful to meet other travelers. Kind of looks a small scale farming is tough. So thank you. Boy, you said it all. The economics of small farming. They're not just tough. I mean, I feel like Sisyphus in, in, in Greek mythology trying to push that ball up the hill. It's like every time you think you get it going, it's just going to roll right over you again. Which is why I think most small farmers worldwide diversify, have a second job or other business or are wealthy before they can start. Um, it's like that old uh, saying about if you want to make a million dollars in the wine industry, you better start with $2 million. And that's pretty much the same with small organic farming. If you want to make a living at it, you better already have a big savings. Um, but yeah, love to have you out. Love to connect with you. Maybe we can even do a podcast together. I like connecting with other farmers like that, sharing things worldwide on Zoom and then converting it to my YouTube podcast. So if you're interested, again, please contact me through my website. And Red Rob, uh, hi Chuck, from Merry Old England. Nice to see you. Cheerio. 
wondering if there are farming opportunities for international folks. Yes, there are. I was talking about my uh, work away program as well as my um, Airbnb experiences. So it really depends on what level you want to enter at for me. And I'm sure for other firms as well, but Japan is opening up more to having people on their farms and learning that there's there's a market there, not only for, for money, but for volunteers and for experiences and things like that. So if you have a look on the Airbnb experiences site and other tour sites, and then on the Workaway and other volunteer platforms, I think you'll find some, some opportunities out there that you can see that fit your wants and needs. And you can always contact me there again through my website and ask me anything course and so yeah keep that spirit because i think for all of you listening um give it a try you might be surprised at, at how much you really touched by uh by being out there you know by the sense of it all you know you walk into a, a shopping mall and you see these these giant stores and all these people spending all their money in this air-conditioned fast food heaven and then you go to a farm and you realize like, wow, we've come a long way and we haven't made any progress. <laughs> so being out on a farm is a real treat, um, not just for, you know, the mind, but for the body and the soul, and all the senses. I mean, it's all out there. The smells, the taste, the insects and the clouds. And again, the breeze that, that comes across your neck on a hot day or the sun that comes out on a cold one, you just flash back to what's really important and the things that are most precious in life are not those things they sell at the mall, you know? Um, uh, yeah, uh, reflecting of your own journey to farming, what are some ways that more young people in Japan can be motivated to enter the farming industry? That's a tough one. That is a tough one because the, de the tendency in Japan has definitely been away from not even just farming, but from the uh, living in the countryside. Um, both of the communities that I'm, I've been farming in have been depopulated uh, over the past 20 years quite a bit. Um, and I think that's a nationwide tendency uh, or trend, I should say, that um, most of the people are migrating towards the urban centers of Japan leaving the countryside barren. And that's depressing, especially for the communities that are still exist there, of course. But it's also such a waste, so motainai of the great farmland and other resources that are still available there. And I, I've spent years driving through the countryside wondering, gosh, there's an old elementary school that's empty, been empty for over a decade and could be converted into a a volunteer center or you know a tourist center or something like that but because there's no immediate profit evident that it probably won't happen um so to try to get people into farming again well let me tell you this i i talked about a grant program that i started um and this grant program was given out by a corporation that started this grant for people to preserve something and i don't know if you've ever heard of the medaka which is a type of fish that's quite small, looks like a guppy, um, and uh, used to be quite prevalent in the natural areas and living in the rice fields. And it was kind of a symbiotic relationship between it and the rice because it could live quite well in the rice areas and eat a lot of the algae and other things in the, in the water. And then its, uh, its droppings would help fertilize the rice. And then as chemical the agriculture moved in, fish would die out because they couldn't live among all the chemicals. And um, so some people have uh, started programs to preserve the medaka and preserve wetlands and preserve birds and flowers and trees and things like that. What I wanted to preserve was the tradition of people having the opportunity to go out to a farm and harvest sweet potatoes. I'd heard about this as a tradition for years. And I started doing that for events about 10 years ago. And people were like, gosh, I did this when I was a kid. And now we can't do it because there's no more small farms. The little farms that used to be around in the community where kindergartens could hook up and say, hey, we're going to come out and harvest. But they just don't exist anymore. So this is what I started the, my grant program about three years ago, and it's still going. Like I said, last Sunday, I did my, my big event of harvesting sweet potatoes. 25 people came out harvesting about 200 kilograms 
And there were 10 kids there, if not 12. And um, that is a way for kids to get back into it, is just give them that personal experience. And that's what I say to everybody, uh, volunteers, uh, tourists, people who attend events. Don't just watch the podcast. Don't just read the book. Don't just eat the food. Have the personal experience. Jump into the pool. Feel what it's like. And then your body and your mind can change because that's 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 what we are. We're we're just human beings out for the experience. And when we have that experience of being on a farm and seeing and feeling and tasting what that's like, then we have an opportunity to understand it and to realize that it's important and to move in that direction because we'll know that it's possible and it's valuable. So I think for all kids at around the world is give them the opportunity to experience it for themselves and that will probably be half the battle right there sorry that was a long answer for that question but i do have a lot to say about that because as a teacher for over 25 years i'm very connected to kids and their education because they are our future um, they are the future and we really owe it to ourselves and to them to really give them uh, every chance we can to make the right decision, you know, because everything else is just about what's what YouTuber do you like? What game are you playing? Or what kind of shoes are you wearing? And these things are all interesting and all that, but give them the opportunity to have one more thing in their purview. And that's maybe all it takes. Um, very good to hear. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome, Red. One of my favorite experiences was the duck eggs and tomatoes our neighbor used to bring us from his little allotment. It tasted truly out of this world. Organic is the way to go. I love to hear that, Rep. And, you know, I know ducks are often used here in Japan and on other places on rice fields as well. So that's one thing that ducks will eat the little plants, the weeds and stuff around the rice and leave the rice alone. That's another nice little organic hack there. Um, yeah, Tori, it is, it's awful to see the aging farming population here um, and they're healthy as can be. You know, you think it's the best thing out there. It's the best job out there. If you want to be of healthy mind, of healthy body, able to sleep at night, not be just because you're dead tired, but because you're so proud of what you do and that this is dying out. It's almost like part of our soul is dying away, the soul of Japan. But I think it's a worldwide trend. Kirby, thanks so much for engaging us in a Nice presentation. Thank you. Take your leave. See you on the other side of the policy negotiations. <laughs> Thanks, Purdy. Do you know any additional resources, Tori says, or methods of tackling countryside revitalization in addition to engage, encouraging organic farming? There are some government support groups that I've tried to get through, but it's a bit too much red tape for me and you know, procedure. I think personal initiative is the way to go. And I'm going to put myself on a limb here and just say that because try to make a connection with somebody in the area, get some permission and just do something like a river cleanup kind of thing. But in the countryside, rather than river cleanup, kind of a farm revitalization, just try to find who's like, I just want to grow vegetables here and see it's possible, bring people out, uh, bring a bunch of kids out and have them harvest to have an experience. Chances are that people will be like, yeah, that sounds great. Because I got to tell you, um, when I started going up to the villages uh, before I ever started about farming, I saw all these empty resources. And when the guy was who, who hooked me up with my first farm, I was like, why are you gonna let me use this land for free? And I really didn't understand it. And then after a few years, I realized, gosh, it takes a lot of work to keep this farm clear of weeds. And boy, once I got it started, the soil was really good. And after several years, I realized, boy, now my soil is awesome. And if I were to walk away from this field, even in a year, it would go right back to nature, which sounds great, right? But for a farmer who have done a lifetime of work keeping that soil healthy and strong, to see it all just wasted in, in a year, it's tragic. So the people who've created these farms and these other resources and um, um, infrastructure out there, they want it to be used. They do. So if you just approach it in the right way, I think you might be surprised at how agreeable people are to allow you to get get on board and, and to do something. Um, oh, okay, great, 100% agree. I've planted and harvested rice with my students in Hyogo. Such a wonderful experience. Tori, great, that's awesome, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about getting into rice growing 
uh, just for that, just to get people the chance to do those events of planting the rice and harvesting it and things like that. Um, I'm not a big, big fan of rice. I think vegetables are more important, but I do think it's a, it's a necessary thing. It's a staple food here, and I do eat a lot of it, actually. So um, it's a lot of machinery involved and other things, but it's an opportunity again, I see. And when I, when I grow crops these days, and just to, I don't think I've said this, but I probably grow 70 different kinds of vegetables, 70, seven zero. And, you know, that's not saying 70 seed packs. That's probably four or 500 seed packs because many of the things I grow five to 10 varieties. Of. I mean, just tomatoes, I probably grow 10 varieties of those. Radishes, I probably grow 10 varieties of those. Lettuces too. So, um, you know, when I do pick those seeds out, um, Oftentimes it's like, oh, that looks cool, or oh, I want to try that, or oh, this one grows really well, or oh, my customers like this one. But sometimes it's just about, you know, I'm going to try that because I think I can make an event out of that. So um, rice is one of those things because it is such a labor-intensive process. I think that it would be fun to do. Um, yeah. Well, I think I've gotten through all the questions in the chat. I'm very happy if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask me something personally. Or we can wrap up early. I don't mind either way. I'm here to, uh, to just uh, talk and I'll just yammer away like most farmers do. Okay, well, I think Tori is still here. Is that correct? Yes. Tori? Okay. Thank you so much. I'm here. 